Lord, and turn with you to the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, we're going to read there in just a little bit, Genesis chapter 3, we've been dealing with this subject of biblical uh, manhood and womanhood, and we're here at this uh, fourth study, and uh, we've been looking primarily here at the opening part of the Bible in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, we're going to look in Genesis chapter 3. Had some scriptures here in just a moment, and we've been talking about uh, how we ought to view manhood and womanhood from a biblical perspective. Um, how does gender, and there are only two genders, male and female, it's hard to believe you have to define that today, you know, but the truth of the matter, you do. Now, we don't, from the scriptures, God defines it for us very simply, right? But uh, how does our gender, male and female, how does that reflect the glory of God? How does that reflect the glory of God? Does God have a specific... ...different from man? What does the Bible have to say about it? That's the most important thing, right? Not, um, not modern culture, uh, not political policy... Uh, not anyone or anything else. What does God's Word have to say about it? And then, how does that affect the way that we take the gospel to the next generation? Whether it be within our own homes, uh, within our church, within our community. How does, it, how does that affect it? Our, our view, our understanding is very important in this regard. Because it doesn't matter what kinds of programs or uh, activities that we have for uh, small children or uh, teenagers or whatever the case may be, if we are not us that make up Calvary Independent Baptist Church, if we're not biblical men and biblical women with biblical marriages seeking to live out a biblical, biblical parenting role, and even, even as singles as a part of this church, living out a, a God-honoring, Christ-honoring, biblical uh, way of living the single life, it doesn't matter what kind of activities or programs we have. They're not, they're not going to do any good if we're not living it out ourselves. So what does it look like? What is biblical manhood and biblical womanhood? What does it look like? What does God call us to train young men to be? What does God call us to train young uh, ladies to be? A uh, very interesting quote came across. A well-known uh, pastor said the following. He said this, the tendency today is to stress the equality of men and women by minimizing the unique significance of our maleness or femaleness. But this depreciation of male and female personhood is a great loss and is taking a tremendous toll on generations of young men and women who do not know what it means to be a man or woman. He goes on, confusion over the meaning of sexual personhood today is epidemic. The consequence of this confusion is not a free and happy harmony among gender-free persons relating on the base of abstract competencies. That's a mouthful, isn't it? The consequence, rather, is... What is the consequence? More divorce, more homosexuality, more sexual abuse, more promiscuity, more social awkwardness, and more emotional distress, and suicide that come with the loss of God-given identity. Boy, there's, there's the key, right? God-given identity. It's not, it's not something that, you know, we just decide on, right? God has given it to us. He's the one that's outlined it. He's the one that's laid it out. And every person is born male and female. They were born male and female. One or the other, right? It's not something that's, that's up, for, up for debate according to the Scriptures. Make no mistake about it. So let's, let's summarize some of what we've already talked about. Summarize manhood and womanhood. We talked about three different things. What's God's design for manhood and womanhood and what does it look like in practice? What is it, how, how does it flesh out? Well, we've already talked about three truths. Remember those three truths. The first one was God created man and woman with equal dignity, equal worth. Both men and women made in the image 
of God, made in the likeness of God, made as a representation of God. Man not superior to woman, woman not superior to man. Any man who belittles a woman is violating the design of God. Any woman who disparages man is undercutting the design of God. Men and women created by God with equal dignity at the same time. Also, we have not only created with equal dignity and equal worth, but with different roles, right? Different roles, we talked about that. Roles that don't call into question the dignity and they don't call into question the worth in any way. That's what's clear. We looked at it in chapter 1, chapter 2 of Genesis. We walked through eight reasons why we know that is true. Man was created to be the head in a position of loving authority. He was created first by the design of God with responsibility. He has representation before God. He has authority, authority that's entrusted by God to him. Woman was created, Genesis 2.18 and Genesis 2.20. Woman was created to be the helper. The word helper used twice there in verse 18, verse number 20. Helper suitable for man, equal in dignity, equal in worth, different in role but in a complimentary way, in a good way, not unfair, not, not demeaning, not denigrating, not any of those things, because we realize God did all of this, man and woman, equal worth, equal dignity, different roles. He did all of this as a reflection of himself. The third thing, he created men and women as a reflection of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Equal, equal in essence, equal in worth, different in role. It's not uh, chauvinistic, it's not domineering for God the Father to have authority over God the Son. For God the Son to be seated at the right hand of the Father. For God the Son to submit to the Father's will. It's not a bad thing. It's, it's a good thing. And this is where we see the understanding of the, the personhood of God is vital to understand biblical manhood and biblical womanhood. Vital. So God created all of us, men and women, both with equal dignity, different roles, for our good and for His ultimate glory. Now, what's happened? What happens when we get to Genesis chapter 3? What enters uh, into uh, the world? What, what, what comes about? Genesis chapter 3, we call it the fall of man, right? And what comes into the picture? Sin comes into the picture. And when sin enters into the picture... Everything gets distorted. Everything goes haywire, if we will. And we, we bear the effects of sin. We get distorted ideas of what manhood and what womanhood uh, look like. And we see it all across our culture. So Genesis chapter 3, sin's distortion of manhood and womanhood. We see it here in this third chapter. Genesis chapter 3. Every detail in what we're about to read is very important. The anatomy, the consequence of sin are intertwined directly with manhood and womanhood. They're interweaved. Sin affects man differently than it affects woman. We see it here in Genesis chapter 3. It expresses itself differently in man and woman. The results of sin are different in man and woman. So let's go here, Genesis chapter 3. And really we should probably take the time. We're not going to. We'll start at verse 8. We should probably pick it up in verse 1, but we'll start at verse 8 and read down through verse number 19. The Bible says, They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Genesis 3, 8. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. What were they filling? They were filling guilt. And what else? Shame, right? They disobeyed the clear command of God. Verse number 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam. Who did, he, who did he seek out? He sought out Adam, right? Why? Adam has the authority. And said unto him, where art thou? You're the head. You're the leader. Where are you? Verse number 10, he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? The man said, the woman... Here's, here's a distortion, right? Blame shifting. The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. The Lord God said to the woman, What is this that thou hast done? The woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. She just copied what Adam did, right? 
Verse 14, the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam, he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return of the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So sin's distortion of manhood and womanhood. We're going to start where God starts. We're going to start with man, manhood, manhood. So in both manhood and womanhood in Genesis chapter 3 here, there's a picture of both passive and active situations that sin expresses itself. Passive and active situations that, that, that sin expresses itself. So Genesis chapter 3, go back to verse number 1 because we are going to read the first five verses. I want you to see, first of all, the passive expression. The passive expression is this. There is a passive spineless abdication of responsibility by man. There's an abdication of responsibility by man. Look at Genesis chapter 3. All right, verse number 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Don't miss that. More subtle than any beast of the field. Notice, notice what's going to happen. And he said unto the woman, he didn't go to the head, he went to the helper. Yea, if God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, Ye may eat of the fruit, you may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said to the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil. And I said, Wait a minute, Pastor, I thought you said we're starting with manhood. I don't see Adam mentioned. And that's the problem. And that's the problem. Where is he? I, I don't see him anywhere in these first five verses of Genesis chapter 3. He's nowhere, he's nowhere to be found. It, it, seems, it seems by implication that he's standing idly by. Notice how the serpent comes there in verse number 1. He's subtle. And who does he attack? Well, he subverts. He himself, Satan himself, subverts the design of God. He doesn't go to the man. He goes to the woman. That's where he heads. He doesn't come to the head. He doesn't come to the man. He comes to the woman. For all we can tell, all we know, is Adam is on the sidelines. He's idly by. He's not there. And really, what's the serpent saying? The, the, the serpent is saying, yeah, yeah, I, I know what's been told. I know what you've been told, but you lead the way. You do it. You, 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 take, you take it on. You, you take the authority on. You, you, you make the decision. The serpent undercuts the design of God in the very way that he works this temptation here in Genesis chapter 3. Now, let me ask you a question. Is temptation sin? No, it's not. Giving in to temptation is, right? Yielding to temptation is. Temptation itself is not sin, but yielding to it is. Now, in verse 17, we read it just a second ago, but look, just look over there at it. Chapter 3, verse number 17. So the serpent undercuts, even in his temptation, the design of God. But notice verse number 17. When God speaks to Adam, what does he say? Well, look there, verse 17. And unto Adam he said, what, what, what are the words here? Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. You've, you've messed up the order. You've listened to the tempter. You, you've got the order out of whack. You, you have hearkened to the helper when you are supposed to be the head. You're the one that's supposed to be the ones making the decision. Now, before he even addresses the fact 
that they took of the fruit and they ate of the fruit, which was direct disobedience to the command of God that Adam had been given. He said this, fundamentally the problem is you listened to Eve instead of taking the lead. You stood silently by and did nothing. You did nothing. Then Adam has the audacity, when God confronts him about his sin, he has the audacity to do what? It's her fault. It's her fault. He blames the woman. What is that? That's abdication of his own responsibility to take the lead. The fact of the matter is, I don't think I have to tell you this. I think it's very evident. The abdication of responsibility, which is spineless, is alive and well today in our culture. Many a man, many a husband, many a father refuses to lead. They waste their time. They, they, they never come home. They don't step up and take responsibility to lead their wives, to lead their children. They're males, yes, but they think they're men who are really nothing but boys who are shirking responsibility that God himself entrusted to them. And it's all over the place. Spineless abdication of responsibility. Abdicating the responsibility of headship that God gave them that's their responsibility before God. Okay, so that's the passive picture. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. We don't see Adam. He's nowhere to be found. He's abdicated the responsibility. He's allowed Eve to take the lead that he refused to take. So what's the active? So then you go to the other side of the spectrum, right? So you have pass passivity over here with the abdication. Then you go to the other side and you have abuse. You have abuse. You have a more aggressive picture, a selfish abuse of God-given authority. That's the other side of the spectrum in the reaction. Man rises up, okay, well, I'm not going to be the wimp in this relationship. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to dominate this relationship. I tell you what, everybody's going to know, she's going to know who's in charge around here, buddy. A domineering picture. Matter of fact, some people believe the phrase at the end of verse 16, Genesis chapter 3, he shall rule the idea there uh, that they believe a harsh, forceful, uh, oppressive domination. By the way, that's a distortion of the design, the design of God as well. Headship, we talked about this already, does not equal domination. God's design is not domination. That's a distortion. Man abusing his position of authority in the relationship. So today in our culture, what do you see? You see that as well, right? You see both the passive and the active. You see uh, uh, the abdication and you see the abuse in all kinds of circumstances. As a result, the punishment for sin in man's life is then specifically linked to his responsibility. As a result of sin, man will experience pain in his role. He will experience pain in his role. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, if you just go back there, uh, verse 15. Genesis 2, 15. The Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden and his responsibility to dress it and to keep it, to provide for it, to care for it. Man was commanded to do it in a way that woman was not commanded to do it working the ground, providing for his home. But now if you go to chapter 3 and you look at verse number 17, we read the first part that God said, because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, okay, here it is, and has eaten of the tree, okay, direct disobedience, you messed up the order and then you directly disobeyed. He says, of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it. Then verse 17, cursed is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shalt bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Till thou return to the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art and to dust shalt thou return. So as a result of sin, God says, your working, your toil, it's going to bring struggle. And eventually it's going to bring what? It's going to bring physical death. It's going to bring physical death. This is a gender-specific punishment for sin. 
Sin's distortion of manhood, where man had the responsibility of taking the headship, the authority, not domineering, not denigrating, equal in worth, equal in dignity to the woman, different roles, representing the Trinity, the personhood of God, failed to do so, abdicated his responsibility. The abuse on the other side, the active, what we see, the abuse of power, God says, okay, this, this punishment is going to fit exactly what I told you to do, to dress it and to keep it. This is going to be your punishment because of it, because you failed in your responsibility. Now, the truth of the matter is, gentlemen, right, we still have the responsibility today to take the loving headship of our home, not in a domineering fashion, not in a denigrating fashion, right? The Apostle Paul wrote uh, in the book of Galatians that in the sight of God, you know, that not anyone's any greater than other, male or female, Jew or Gentile, uh, bond or free. We're all one in Christ, equal dignity, equal worth. But we have responsibility. And we live in a day when many, many a man has abdicated his responsibility. He's just totally forsaken it, totally left it. Went on to do his own, went on to do his own thing. Live his own way. Well, we, we who know Christ, we who make up the bride of Christ as believers and as men, we need to take the lead here. Take the lead at home, take the lead in the church. Take the lead in the community. This world needs to see what true biblical manhood is. And God help us to live it out. God has designed it that way. If we'll live it, if we'll practice it, then there's blessing. There's always blessing for obedience, right? God always blesses obedience. And so we have a responsibility uh, to live it out. All right, next Wednesday we're going we're gonna to get... To the, to the ladies, okay? So I didn't leave you ladies out. That'll be next, uh, next Wednesday, all right? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to be able to gather together. We thank you for your word. Uh, Lord, help us, uh, help the men of this church, myself, others. Lord, I pray that we'd live out the true example that you have set out in the design that you made us, that you created us. Lord, help us not to be domineering, not to be denigrating. Lord, but I pray you'd help us to take the head that is our responsibility to take, our role to take. And Lord, to lead lovingly, just as the Heavenly Father has loved us and has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, showed His love for us in sending that only begotten Son. Lord, I pray that we'd have that same spirit, that same attitude as we lead our families, our homes, as we take the lead and responsibility in the local church. God, as we pray, help us to have Christ-honoring homes, homes that follow the design of God from the Word of God, we pray, uh, to be a testimony of biblical manhood in this world in which we live. Give us wisdom now as we share requests one with another and the Lord help us to pray as you'd have us to we ask these things in Jesus name amen well amen very good and uh, I don't have any uh, prayer requests that are right here in front of me I'm looking to see if there are any that came in I don't see any that came in um, through the internet here does anybody have any others obviously be praying for brother Henry uh, let's see, I did, get a, I did get an email earlier from um, Cindy Thompson uh, from the Baltimore Rescue Mission. She was checking in to see how things are going. Things are back up operating smoothly there. They did lose one staff member uh, to COVID, and I think I mentioned that probably a month and a half ago, maybe two months ago now. Lots of, I think it was about eight staff members that actually had the virus. They had to be quarantined for a while. I think they had in the teens 
of men that were clients that had it, and no one in the Karis home, which is the side of the mission that we go to, the ladies' side, no one there had it. And uh, so that's, that was a blessing. Those gentlemen were quarantined, and they have gotten over that. And uh, so, praise the Lord, they're, they're deemed fine and healthy, and so praise God for that. Pray it stays that way. Uh, any specific requests this evening? Brother Neil. Okay. Pray for Sarah and her eye. She had surgery in her eye, of course, uh, several weeks ago now. And pray that this pressure would be relieved there. She got some drops to put in it. Good. Okay. What was his last name? Quigley. So Sarah's asked us to pray for a doctor, Dr. Quigley, for salvation. Okay. Logan. Sure. Mm. Mm. Now is Dennis in the hospital? Okay. Okay. So pray for Dennis Rhodes, and he has pneumonia, possible cancer, and the great need he has, of course, is for salvation. Pray for Loken's dad as he continues to try to witness to Dennis. And then pray for Dennis's son, Justin, and the daughter, uh, Riley. And they need salvation as well. Okay. Berlin?
continue to pray for Jeffrey praying, and he's getting some some of the vision back, seeing some colors. Still got, did you say two weeks? Steroids. And you can pray for Dave Krause, friend of Lynn's, and a recovery there from surgery. Okay. Ms. Crowder. So I have a couple of requests here from Cindy, and one is her new video she's working on, gospel video, so pray for that, and that it would have good reach and lots of views and folks would come to Christ. And then some folks she's praying for for their assurance of salvation, Maria and Carl uh, Thole, and Mrs. Crowder asks us to pray, continue to pray for brother Harry, uh, Harry Landis, and and have to have more chemo. So remember him in prayer. Megan. Okay. So Megan has unspoken requests. And then she has a witnessing opportunity with a coworker. So pray that God give her wisdom and the coworker would have an open heart to the gospel. Brandon. Okay. Brandon has a couple unspokens. Okay. Any others? All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer here. Appreciate you being here tonight. Appreciate those who are watching and listening along. And God bless you for being here. We'll pray, and then you're dismissed.